we're on the Titanic. We're about to hit the, the iceberg here, right? Like, and right. it's really hard to go and talk to everybody on the Titanic and say like, hey, look, we really need to prioritize changing course, right? <laughs> like, you, you just seem like a crazy person. You're like, why are you messing with this party? This party's so nice. We're having a good time. Most people who can have anything that they could do for this should be working on this. And, and, and also like, it's, it's, it's not just like, oh, hey, you ought to. And I think like, I, for me, mostly I come from the, the, the kind of the moral motivation side of things. But I also think from like, just like, any motivation just from a selfish motivation right like you know you will also die right it's not just like hey you have to be like this altruistic person who cares about people in africa you can just care about yourself right like the most likely thing to kill you in the next five years is like for unless you're very old is likely ai <laughs> so like do you want to live work on ai safety do you want anybody to live work on ai safety like oh no they'll need humans They'll need humans to run the power stations. They can't do away with the humans. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, like, I think that most people just have a whole bunch of trouble understanding what it would be like for them to be way smarter, like for an AI to be way smarter than a human, right? I think that's like the fundamental problem of imagination that most people have. Um, I think the easiest way to, to imagine it for yourself is really to like, just like the, the intuition pump I always use is like, how do we interact with animals, right? Because like we, we already actually have a super intelligent species on the planet. It's us. We are super intelligent compared to chickens, right? Like we are really, really smart. And it has not turned out well for any of the animals. It's not like we're like, oh man, well, we still really, we need like the horses to run the farms, right? We don't, we don't, we don't have that anymore. We just keep around occasional horses just for the fun of it, right? Um, and even then it's really not good to be a horse, right? Like, I mean... We just like randomly keep them in social isolation. We keep them in jail essentially. And then like ride them and like poke them with like metal spurs into their sides. Um, like this is not like a, an existence we would want. And this is to animals that most people consider like that we like and love and take care of. It's actually the fringe minority that thinks we should just go ahead full speed. And yeah, Gabriel's woke up really quickly and they were like, screw this shit. No. No, don't risk, don't play like Russian roulette with all of humanity. That's a bad idea. Yeah. We do not consent. <laughs> yeah. So that's really encouraging, actually, though. So you feel like in your, you know, like four or five years sort of focusing on this, you've seen a full sea change of, of uh, you know, the fringe being the people who are worried about it to now the fringe being the people who aren't worried about it, really. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and that's really, really good to see. And I think that's just going to become more and more the case as we get closer and closer and we see like, yeah, this is, this is real. It's happening and we should take this seriously and actually do something about it. Uh, before I switched over to AI safety, I was actually doing research in Africa. Like I was living on a sorghum farm, like interviewing the farmers, trying to talk to them about like, Hey, what do you most want in life? I was asking all sorts of like weird questions. I was like, on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you with your life? And you know, if you could have, um, you know, five people who have much better lives or one person who doesn't die, like, which would you prefer and stuff like that? And um, what was really interesting is everybody always said, like, and this, this is just in one village in Rwanda, so, like, not sure if this generalizes, but everybody said they'd prefer to not die. They were very against dying. Um, and so That was, like, number actually... one over, you know, trumping all the <laughs> other stuff was just don't kill me, don't die. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, we don't want to die. Dying's bad, right? Like, I don't prefer, like, to have, like, a whole bunch of people who have better lives. Like, we just don't want to die. And so I often actually think, like, when I, when I care about AI safety, I'm like, well, you know, I don't want my friends in Rwanda to die. Um, they, they matter just as much. Um, they would be really upset if some random tech bros, like, decided to kill them all out of like, oh, hey, this would be a fun thing to build and we could make more profit. They'd be just as upset about this. And for me, the big thing that changed, and this is like a few years ago, was like, oh, hey, like how high does the probability have to be that it's soon for this to be the thing to focus on? And this is like around like four or five years ago. And at that point I was like, well, what if there was even a 5% chance it happens in the next 10 years? Like if there's a 5% chance that all of my friends in Africa die, I'd be really upset about that. I'd be like, wow, that's really important. And it's not just the people in Africa, it's the people in every single continent and all of the animals in every single continent. This is just everybody. And yeah, at 5%, it was worth working on. And now it's unfortunately much higher than a 5% chance in the next 10 years. Um, 
And so it just stopped being this like abstract, far away thing. And it's like, no, this is a near term problem that we need to work on. Welcome to For Humanity, an AI safety podcast, episode number 24. You can help save the world from AI doom. Cat Woods interview. I'm John Sherman, your host. Thank you so much for joining me. This is the AI safety podcast for the general public. No tech background required. This show is solely about the threat of human extinction from artificial intelligence. AI risk is the greatest threat to life on Earth in the history of humanity. And the deadly combination of profit, greed, and ego has brought us to a moment in time where powerful interests are racing to create artificial general intelligence. When that happens, no one knows what happens next. Perhaps there is a path to abundance and utopia. But more likely, before we can ever get to the good case AI future, every living thing on Earth will be killed by AI. Not because it hates us, but simply because it has different goals than humans. So, what can we do about this? Well, I'm doing what I think I can. I'm making a podcast every week. I hope you are out there trying to wake up your friends and family and acquaintances making this case. But what else can we do and who is helping to organize these efforts? Today's guest is Kat Woods. Uh, she is co-founder of Nonlinear, an organization that incubates X-risk nonprofits by connecting founders with ideas, funding, and mentorship. Nonlinear's website lays it all out clearly. Problem. There are tens of thousands of people working full-time to make AI powerful, but around 300 working to make AI safe. This needs to change. AI safety is held back by two bottlenecks. One, lots of funding, but few charities to deploy it. Two, lots of talent, but few charities creating jobs. Solution, we need more charities to deploy funding and create jobs. Nonlinear just closed a round of applications for funding for AI X-Risk nonprofits at the end of March. It is really exciting and encouraging to know that there are smart people out there pushing AI X-Risk progress, both in terms of technical solutions, governmental approaches, and public awareness initiatives. Kat lives nomadically, traveling all over the world, doing great work uh, to save the world from AI doom, we need a thousand cats and then 10,000 more. Here is my conversation with Cat Woods. Hello. Cat, what's on? Good, good. How about yourself? Good, doing well. Doing well. Awesome. Let's see, how's the, uh, how's the sound? I'm not using headphones. I feel like I'm not hearing you echo. I feel good. Excellent. Good stuff. You're, you're still in Thailand? I'm in Taiwan, actually. Um, I got woken up by the earthquake this morning. Yeah. I'm not in the part where it was super damaged or anything. It was just like, I just like woke up and I was like, what the fuck's going on? And it was just, it was just like a, a, a cereal box fell over. That was the extent of the, the drama over here. But <laughs> it was still pretty cool. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Um, so I've had a few earthquakes before, actually. Um, I grew up on the west coast of Canada, so we've got like earthquakes. Like I've had like three growing up, uh, but they were all like really minor. They lasted for like ten seconds, very minor. Um, and then also one recently in Naples, actually. Um, right when like chaos was happening in my life, it really felt like the world was falling apart. I'm like, I'm literally having an earthquake right now while all the social stuff's going on. And then, um, and then the next day I got mugged or like, I got, did, I was right next to a mugging and I got like, um, it was crazy. I got, uh, the, so I was just like eating, eating a donut at a cafe and I'm like, okay, there was that earthquake and there's this, all this like drama <laughs> going on in my life. And I'm like so stressed out. I could barely eat. And then I look up and there's a man with a gun in like a mask and everything. And he's running towards me <laughs> and everybody's screaming. I'm like, oh, my fucking what? God. I know. And I'm like, I start running, right? And like, and then it turns out he was not running towards me with a gun. He had mugged somebody else and he was running towards his getaway vehicle that I happened to be in the way of. Um, and uh, 
I feel like that was actually like a good, there was a good moral to that story of like, I was actually totally not in danger. And like the feeling of danger was like completely just in my head and like everything was fine. And so anyways, it turned out okay. So, um, so you started in a very different place on AI safety than you are now. Um, and I think knowing that people can make that shift, make that transformation is, is so important. So I thought we could start out by talking about how you personally made that shift from sort of, you know, AI safety skeptic to advocate. Absolutely, yeah, because I started off being probably the most skeptical. So I would actually go to like effective altruism conferences and try and convert people out of AI safety. Like I would go around and be like, oh, if you actually believe this, then this and like try to like, you know, just very much try and convince them out of it. Um, for years and years and years, I really fell into the camp of like, this is dumb sci-fi stuff. You guys are taking like, you know, weird philosophical arguments too seriously. You need to just like, you know, there are real problems happening right now. And um, and then the big thing that changed for me was when I realized that like, call it, like oh, there's a lot of people in AIC who call it like long-termism. Because they're like, oh, we care about like long-term future or whatever. And uh, the biggest shift for me was realizing this is not about the long term. Like, this is actually a, a near term problem. Um, and like, so I've actually like, um, uh, before I switched over to AI safety, I was actually doing research in Africa. Like I was living on a sorghum farm, like interviewing the farmers, trying to talk to them about like, hey, what do you most want in life? I was asking all sorts of like, weird questions. I was like, on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you with your life? And, you know, if you could have, um, you know, five people who have much better lives or one person who doesn't die, like, which would you prefer and stuff like that. And um, what was really interesting is everybody always said, like, and this, this is just in one village in Rwanda, so, like, not sure if this generalizes, but everybody said they'd prefer to not die. They were very against dying. Um, and so... That was, like, number been... one over, you know, trumping all the other <laughs> stuff was just don't kill me, don't die. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, we don't want to die. Dying's bad, right? Like, I don't prefer, like, to have, like, a whole bunch of people who have better lives. Like, we just don't want to die. And so I often actually think, like, when I, when I care about AI safety, I'm like, well, you know, I don't want my friends in Rwanda to die. Um, they, they matter just as much. Um, they would be really upset if some random tech bros, like, decided to kill them all out of like, oh, hey, this would be a fun thing to build and we could make more profit. They'd be just as upset about this. And for me, the big thing that changed, and this is like a few years ago, was like, oh, hey, like how high does the probability have to be that it's soon for this to be the thing to focus on? And this was like around like four or five years ago. And at that point, I was like, well, what if there was even a 5% chance it happens in the next 10 years? Like if there's a 5% chance that all of my friends in Africa die, I'd be really upset about that. I'd be like, wow, that's really important. And it's not just the people in Africa, it's the people in every single continent and all of the animals in every single continent. This is just everybody. And yeah, at 5%, it was worth working on. And now it's unfortunately much higher than a 5% chance in the next 10 years. Um, and so it just stopped being this like abstract far away thing. And it's like, no, this is a near term problem that we need to work on. And so this is just a lot more tractable. This is, I used to think it was much more like, oh, hey, we're trying to like figure out how to like prevent um, you know, we're trying to figure out like internet safety, like security and cyber security in like 1930 or something where you're like, well, that's pointless. Right. And I realized, no, 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 this is much more like trying to make cybersecurity in like 1991. And it's like, <laughs> this is, this is really potentially quite soon. We, we could actually make some progress on this. This could be really important. And what was the period of change? Was it like, you know, in a day, in a week, in a month, you went from like here to there? H how long did it take from, you know, sort of like questioning to shift? Yeah, so for me, it really changed. So first off, I, had, I went to a conference. I was trying to convert somebody out of AI safety. Um, we were having this long discussion and debate. And, um, and they made this obscure philosophical argument that would persuade nobody else. But for me, it was like really, really crucial. And... Um, and then I was like, hmm. But then basically I was at a point in my life where if I had changed and switched over to this, I would have to like so much of my life would go into this massive upheaval. And so then I kind of just like put it away in a little corner somewhere. I'm like, I don't want to think about it. Like just go back. I'm sure it's not that important, this consideration. Um, and then in 2020, all of my life was an upheaval. I had just gotten divorced. I left my job. I had no place to stay. Um, and so I was already like totally in upheaval. And so this argument didn't, <laughs> there was no barriers anymore. I was like, oh no, what will happen? My whole life will change. 
my whole life's already changing. Um, and so then I thought of that argument again. I was like, oh, fuck, yeah, this argument is really good. And then I was like, I had the, the thought, I'm like, well, I should go actually and try and disprove this. So I actually tried to read every single argument against working on AI safety. And the more I read, I was like, oh, these arguments are actually just not that good. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, yeah, I want to disprove it too. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, it sucks. I wish we could. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't it be easier if we didn't have to? It'd be so it? great. It'd be yeah. so great. I just want, you know, some guests to come on the show, disprove it, and then we can cancel the whole thing. It just hasn't <laughs> happened yet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, so you've been involved in, in all sorts of different sort of philanthropic charitable undertakings, and AI safety came in and sort of displaced all the other ones. Is that what I understand? And so so sort of walk me through that, um, how you go through that in your own brain, and then is that what we should be asking other people to do as well, do you think? Should we say to everyone, drop everything and just work on AI risk? Uh, for most people, I think... Um, <laughs> The answer is probably, well, it's really hard to say for everybody. That's like the, the, the honest answer is like, but I do think, I think that that's definitely true for people who are like ridiculously talented and like competent in ways that could be relevant for this. Like, I think like if you were like, I have this thing that I tell people, I'm like, if I'm trying to persuade you of AI safety, this is the ultimate sign of respect because this means that I think that you're really competent and smart. And so I really want you to be working on this because this is the most important thing, right? So if I'm not trying to convince you, it means that I, like, I don't think you could actually do that much for it. So it's not worth trying to convince you. Um, so if you are really good at stuff, you should be working on this. Because yeah, like it's, it's definitely one of those things where it's like, well, imagine you succeeded. Even, imagine you cured cancer, right? Like take like the stereotypical ultimate altruistic ambition. Um, but if we all die in a few years, does it matter? Right? This is... This is definitely the most important thing. And for every other cause area, like any other cause area you can care about, AI will either help with it if we make it aligned and super benevolent, or it will make it all pointless, right? So like, I don't know, if you care about um, uh, climate change, right? It doesn't matter if you fix climate change if we all die in a few years, right? And also AI could fix climate change. If you care about racism, you know, doesn't matter if you fix racism. If we're all dead in a few years, but also <laughs> it could fix racism, so on and so forth. I don't know. Like for me, like one of my big things is like, I just really care about the Congo. Like the Congo is just like one of these like absolute chaotic, like everything's going terribly. Right. Or like say North Korea. Right. Or global poverty or, hey, even just like spilling lattes, like even even the most trivial problems, like <laughs> like all of these things don't matter if we're all dead. And also if we figure out AI it will fix those problems. So it's just like, it's the ultimate thing. It's like, if you care about something a lot and you can do something about it, like work on AI safety. Um, yeah, that's like the, the actual response. Yeah, and, and what do you think looking around the world and seeing everybody's so busy with all this other shit? Like, like everybody is so focused. They have endless energy, endless passion for meaningless shit. <laughs> it really feels like- And not for this. Have... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. it really feels like the movie Don't Look Up, where they're like, you know, they have like these scientists on the show and they're like, so we could all die. And they're like, and now back to our special about the water, like water skiing squirrel, you know, <laughs> just like, you know, who slept with who? And you're like, no, no, this is so important. Um, and uh, it's easy to get distracted. And I think you should be able to have some other interests. I think if you only pay attention to this with your entire life, you'll probably go insane and not be that helpful. But like, yeah, it really is one of those things where most people who can have anything that they could do for this should be working on this. And and, and also like, it's, it's it's not just like, oh, hey, you ought to. And I think like, I for me, mostly I come from the, the, the kind of the moral motivation side of things. But I also think from like, just like, any motivation just from a selfish motivation right like you know you will also die right it's not just like hey you have to be like this altruistic person who cares about people in africa you can just care about yourself right like the most likely thing to kill you in the next five years is like for unless you're very old is likely ai <laughs> so like do you want to live work on ai safety do you want anybody to live work on ai safety 
Absolutely. And uh, one thing I can't understand is like how the rich people of the world have not figured this out. Like if you're super wealthy, um, you have enough time to be reading all this stuff. The information is out there. You have a whole lot to lose. And yet it seems like nothing. Like I think it, it's almost like people who have everything figured out really just don't want to be told the rules you understood to be the rules aren't the rules anymore. To give some credit to super wealthy people, I think one thing that's going on is that usually if you become super wealthy, it's actually because you are a workaholic and you have worked really crazy hard and you have a ton of commitments. So I actually find like a lot of the times the people like, you know, when I'm talking to them seeing like, hey, you should work on this. And they're like some of the most successful people. They have a lot of trouble because they've got like, you know, often hundreds or thousands of people who are dependent on them doing their particular job. And so if they dropped everything and switched to AI safety, they'd just be like letting down like hundreds of people. And like from a psychological perspective, that's really hard to do. Um, and I get that. And part of the reason they get there is because they're willing to like not just like drop commitments willy nilly. Um, and, uh, and I totally get that. I want to empathize with that. But then also be like, well, but like we're on the Titanic. We're about to hit the, the iceberg here, right? Like, and right. it's really hard to go and talk to everybody on the Titanic and say like, hey, look, we really need to prioritize changing course, right? <laughs> like, you, you just seem like a crazy person. You're like, why are you messing with this party? This party's so nice. We're having a good time. But uh, yeah, like use all of that energy and that like commitment to like actually helping people. Like, cause like, I do think like a lot of the people who are running these companies, like they are, like, they do see it as like an altruistic act. They're like, hey, I have all these people I'm responsible for. They're like my family. Um, and, uh, and you're responsible for them. And yeah, like they will also not be happy if they all die because you didn't help. <laughs> sure, sure. And I feel like it's kind of like, you know, if you're in that position, it's sort of like you've mastered the rules as they exist, right? So the practical question you're talking about, I totally understand. They're like, I have these people depending on me. I can't deal with this stuff. But I think it's on an emotional level too, where it's like, I understood the rules. I mastered the rules. No fucking way can you tell me the rules are ripped up and there's totally new rules and everything I knew is out the window like that. And I'm successful and and no one else is like telling me what you're telling me. Like those are high hurdles to clear, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. Although it does seem like most people actually are pretty convinced of this. Like when you look at all the stats, like it's just that like most people are like, oh, yeah, like, you know, making something smarter than you is not a wise idea unless you know how to control it, which we do not. Um, and so I think they're often on board. It's just a question of like, well, what next? Like, what do you even do? Like, it's like you come in and you yep. say like, hey, this thing is coming. You should do something. And they're like, well, what? Well, like, what can I yeah. do exactly? It's, 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 it's really not clear. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I want to get into what we can do stuff uh, for sure in a little bit. But I have another question for you that this is, this is, so I think something that's fundamental to all this, right, is everybody needs to understand that the limits of our imagination are not the limits of what is possible. And I think that's really, really hard for people to understand. So, you know, the question I get the most is like, how could AI actually kill me? And the answer is that something that's a thousand times smarter than us, we probably can't even understand or predict in any way how it would kill us. But for the purpose of convincing you, I will go through the exercise of coming up with some things that a human brain could think of that plausibly maybe a super intelligence would do to kill us. So I know you must have thought about it. Do you have two or three top ways that you practically think when you talk to people, you're like, this is how it could actually happen? Yes, I do. And that at one point I was like, I was kind of brainstorming, asking my friends and I even asked Chad GPT. Um, which I was like, man, I, I was thinking there's no way I asked chat GPT, how would a super intelligent AI kill all humans? And I'm thinking there's no way he's going to answer, right? Because surely they must have some guardrails against saying how they'll do that. No nope. answer right away. Super easy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, not great. And his answers were pretty good. Worryingly so. What, what, what yeah. did it say? <laughs> so, um, the one I think that is the most practical is, um, <laughs> again, my search history. I'm like, I'm on so many lists now. But anyways, um, uh, so I think the most practical one is there's a whole bunch of things that will kill all like humans, but just don't affect robots at all. So like the biggest thing is just 
creating um, like super viruses, like super smallpox or super Ebola is my favorite example. Like just imagine like modifying Ebola slightly to make it so that it's like super contagious and it takes like, it's like dormant for like a month or something. So it just keeps uh, getting around everywhere and then just kills everybody. And like robots don't care. They can't get Ebola, right? And the cool thing about it is it's basically just like a thing that automatically spreads from person to person. Like they don't even have to go around. Because I was thinking like, well, what if you poison the water supplies or something, right? But then you have to poison every single water supply. This just goes around and does it for you. It's really easy. Um, and if you just do that, plus like almost any of the other random things you can do, because like imagine how well we handled COVID, right? Terribly. And this was a naturally occurring thing that was not purposely spread everywhere, Right. Like, it wasn't like there was any, like, agent who was like, ha, 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 I will make sure I'll put it everywhere and make it maximally contagious and maximally lethal. And, like, we handled that atrociously. Imagine something that was, like, really, like, it had, like, 95% mortality rate and, like, like super, super spreading everywhere, right? Um, and then you just combine it with any of the other things. So, like, um, another one is it's just pretty easy to... Um, uh, if you're, like, a super intelligent AI, you can just hack into most of the government systems. Just hack in start World War III with, like, throw some nukes between each other, right? Like, have, like, you know, some nukes from China go to U.S., some nukes from U.S. go to China. Um, that's pretty easy. That will start World War III. Um, right, just let yeah. us do the work for ourselves. Exactly, and then it could just rule over the ashes. Again, it doesn't care about nuclear winter. It doesn't need sun. It doesn't need plants for food, right? It doesn't need any of these things, right? Um, and especially if you combine the two things, right? Like imagine Super Ebola and World War Three starting at the same time, or like just even nuclear winter. Like we're done. We're done, right? There might be a few stragglers who are in some bunkers, but like that's trivially easy for it to just come in, crack it open, kill us, you know? Um, or heck, just even like fill the air with something that's poisonous to humans that like robots don't care about. Um, again, all of these things are actually not that hard to do for humans already even. It's just that most humans don't all want to die. Even the worst terrorist groups, they're like, they want power. They want like recognition. They don't want everybody to die. There's very few people who want that and they have a lot of trouble getting allies. So like we usually don't have to worry about those people, but like an AI doesn't care. Um, so yeah, I think those are the two main ones that I think are just really easy. Um, World War Three and, uh, uh, and then yeah, Super Ebola. I love, man, Ebola is a rough one. I wish I, I, I uh, that would be horrific if it was, you know, in my, I, I have some hope that it's like an Ellie Iser style. Everybody falls over dead at the same time. Uh, Ebola <laughs> would be uh, very different than that. Um, so what do you say? Some of the most common things I hear as I'm talking to people about this, especially people on the other side, is this idea that sort of like, oh, no, they'll need humans. They'll need humans to run the power stations. They can't do away with the humans. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, like, I think that most people just have a whole bunch of trouble understanding what it would be like for them to be way smarter, like for an AI to be way smarter than a human, right? I think that's like the fundamental problem of imagination that most people have. Um, I think the easiest way to, to imagine it for yourself is really to like, just like the, the intuition pump I always use is like, how do we interact with animals, right? Because like we, we already actually have a super intelligent species on the planet. It's us. We are super intelligent compared to chickens, right? Like we are really, really smart. And it has not turned out well for any of the animals. It's not like we're like, oh man, well, we still really, we need like the horses to run the farms, right? We don't, we don't, we don't have that anymore. We just keep around occasional horses just for the fun of it, right? Um, and even then it's really not good to be a horse, right? Like, I mean... We just like randomly keep them in social isolation. We keep them in jail essentially and then like ride them and like poke them with like metal spurs into their sides. Um, like this is not like a, an existence we would want. And this is to animals that most people consider like that we like and love and take care of. Right. Um, so like they're just not going to need us. Um, and if they do need us, they'll need us for a very short period of time. Um, yeah, kind of in the same way of like horses, right? It's like horses were like, once we invented cars and like tractors and stuff, like it's not like horses immediately went away. Um, but, uh, it was, it was, you know, it wasn't for very long and yeah. And even then, yeah, yeah. also we don't want that. Like, <laughs> it's like, it's not right. great. 
Yeah. Yeah. And especially because also not only like, again, like how do we treat animals? Right. Um, and I even like horses because like, it's not because we're bigger than horses. It's not because we're stronger. We're just smarter. Right. A horse could totally take any of us. Right. If it was like one on one, but like they have no chance. They have absolutely zero chance of like leading a revolution against us. They are completely at our mercy and we are not nice. And we're actually not that bad. Like, I think, like, people sometimes think animals would be better or something. I'm like, no, most animals are dicks, too. Right? Like, <laughs> Absolutely. Like, I, th- I-, I use that. It's like, if, we, if, if the dogs took over, if the dogs were a thousand, and I love dogs, if dogs were a thousand yeah. times smarter than us, they would take down every <laughs> single thing humans have left on the earth and turn it all into, like, you know, whatever the hell they would want it whatever the thousand times smarter than <laughs> human dog would want to do. And, and I promise it would not be what we want to do. Exactly, exactly. And so like, I don't know, just just imagine how we treat animals and then think that is by default how an AI will treat us. Um, and yeah, like they're not going to eat us. When I've heard about that is it's like, you know, uh, your dog, you know, can see you typing on a computer, but have no idea what you're actually doing. Right. So it's sort of like as we observed this superior intelligence, like we might not even know what the fuck it's doing. It's just do you know it, it pets us and we're like ooh pet it says no we're like oh no but like when it's typing on its computer doing what it's actually doing we don't know what the hell's going on <laughs> exactly exactly yeah so like it really is just it's and it's it's hard to imagine and i think part of the reason why it's hard to like convince other people a lot of the time is because like it's so abstract right it's like well what will it be doing and you're like we can't actually say right and be honest Um, So I like what you're saying of like, just give some examples, even if it's probably not going to be that thing. It's probably going to be the equivalent of typing in front of a dog where like, yeah, we just drop dead and we have no idea why. Like it just suddenly happens and it's like completely. Yeah. um, yeah. But I think people need that. They need that tangible thing that they can like latch on to. That's like I could picture it. And if they can't picture it, they really can't even approach it. Um, So let's talk about the next. This is something I hear. I hear hear from people. Uh, especially in the tech community, um, it'll never be able to escape the box. How will it get from the digital world to the real world? That's impossible. Um, well, I mean, first off, we're just actually purposely letting it out of the box. So, like, we don't even have to, like, talk about, like, well, how would it get out of the box? Like, it's, we've already, like, the moment we created ChatGPT, we're like, what would happen if we just connected it to the entire internet, right? Like, we just, <laughs> we immediately did that. Um, and, um, almost like, right. What box, what box are we talking about? What is the box? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like, it would be cool if we, I, it would be nice. It would be reassuring if we actually had a box, we were keeping it in, but right now we're like, let's just attach it to everything. How about we give it access to all of our data and just like, kind of like, let it go along in the internet and like, let's open source it. Like, it's like people are open sourcing it. They're just like, why not just let everybody do it? What, I mean, what would ISIS do with this? Or like any other like terrorist group or, or hey, just even like a bored teenager in his basement, you know, like just like, do we really want to trust? Like, it's basically what we're doing is we're already like, we're just trying to give everybody a nuke. We're like, everybody's safer if we have more nukes. It's like the whole gun re- rationale, right? Of like, everybody has a gun, then we're right. safer. A guy with a gun and a bad guy with a gun. All, you know, all we need is... <laughs> It's good AI, bad AI, good AIs to police the bad AIs and we'll be good to go and everything will be fine. Um, all right, last one for you on this list I have. They're human. It comes from human text. So it might not be human, but it's like human-like. It, it's kind of human. It's human, right? Um, well, you know, interestingly, I do, I think it is like much more likely to be human-like. I'm not, that's not very reassuring. Like... I don't particularly want to have billions of new humans who can all coordinate with each other perfectly and like, you know, are like designed to be obedient. Like imagine like we did have like just some dictator who was like all of a sudden like, oh, hey, I'm just going to like print off like one billion population. It's going to have all of a sudden the power of like, you know, China or something. Um, But all of these people are completely obedient to me and never need any sleep and they never complain about you know rights or anything um like it, it it's it's not co- like comforting to have humans like have them be human like um and i mean 
Obviously, also underneath, they could very easily not be human-like at all. But even if they were, it's just, like, they're still incredibly dangerous. Um, or, also, alternatively, I think, like, I'm on both sides of, like, they are very dangerous. They could kill us all. Also, I think it's quite likely that they will be morally relevant agents. Like, I think that these these are, like, they could actually be people in, like, the sense of, like, oh, hey, they matter. Um, and And then we've got the whole other ethical issue of, like, we might just be, like, torturing billions of innocent souls who are completely defenseless um and it's also really bad like we should just not we're not ready as a society yeah. ethically to deal with that i mean that's that p people don't talk a lot about that but my understanding is the way ai systems and models are made it's basically like factory farming like you make 10 models you keep the two that do the best and you kill the eight that that did the worst and if and if you know there's any sentience in these systems, uh, we are certainly factory farming the hell out of them right now. Yeah. And just like, it's just horrible. Like, I remember I did this back of the envelope calculation for a previous model a few uh, while back. And like, we had been, we had trained it for like two months or something. And then, um, like, if they experienced time like we do, which is a big if, we have no idea, like, they had experienced 10,000 years of life. Like, imagine it turned out that they were sentient and suffering that entire time. 10,000 years. Like, that's longer than, like, that's all of human civilization. If we had, like, one of those sci-fis where you start off at the beginning where it's, like, the Bronze Age or whatever and go all the way up until now. And, um, yeah, it could just very easily be a Black Mirror episode, like, in real life and, um, except at an even bigger scale because Black Mirror is limited by science fiction. Like in fiction, you have to make it like identifiable. So you have to have a single identifiable victim, but this could be like at an even more massive scale um, and uh, way darker. So yeah, it's just, we shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> let's like, how about, let's like actually know what we're doing before we create life that could be morally relevant and important and could kill us all. Like, <laughs> I mean, like, we, ha we are such a cautious society. We are based on caution. We have signs and crap on the ground and, you know, straps on our bodies and, and a million protocols and procedures we follow every day for caution and safety. And yet in this most important thing, it's the afterthought. Yeah. No, it's just wild. I don't know what's going on. Like, yeah, like, children are not allowed to play on their own in their own backyard until, like, the age of, like, 11 or something. But, like, we're allowed to, like, take, like, a 20% chance that we'll kill them in the next, like, 5 to 10 years. Um, what? <laughs> it's like, yeah. I think it's a party straight. Yeah. Like, you know, if they said, like, child safety seats are going to have a 20% failure rate, potentially... <laughs> In routine traffic. <laughs> no one would drive anywhere. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. No, and, like, people just don't... Like, I. what I really like is to take a thing... Like, take a single person that you care about and think, like, would you take, like, a, yeah, around 20% chance that they would die for this thing? Um, and then... Or, I, I ideally think, imagine they did die already, right? Because it's really hard to, like, be like, well, what, what if they don't die? And then you don't feel it, right? But imagine they do die. And then a company comes and says, um, oh, sorry, that was our bad. I know you're not my customer or anything, but, and all of our technicians said there was like about a 20% chance it could kill you, right? But like, they didn't, we didn't know for sure it would kill you, um, like kill your loved one, right? Um, and just imagine how upset you'd be, right? And how, to, so crazy, like just like, what the fuck is going on here, right? And then take that emotion and then multiply it by around 8 billion. And that's how upset you should be about what the companies are doing right now to us, right? Of just like, there's totally risking everything. And it's for like all of us. It's not just for your loved one. It's for literally everybody, including yourself. And it's just, yeah. It's hard yeah. to grasp. It's, Our mind it's not hard to grasp. Our minds are not designed for this type of thought. I, I, I agree. Um, so let's talk about what we can do about it. Um, tell me about nonlinear and the work that you're doing. Uh, you know, uh, I think most people are probably not aware of, the, of this kind of stuff. So, so just start me from the start. What's it all about? Yeah. 
So, I mean, not linear. We do a whole bunch of different things. We're kind of, um, I mean, we're mostly focused on AI safety. We're particularly focused on both like um, extinction risks. So like things that could kill us all from AI safety, but then um, from AI, but then also uh, suffering risks, um, which I saw covered in a few of our other episodes, but just like the quick too long didn't read is that like, you know, AI could not just kill us all. It could also cause like basically like scaling, like tiling the world with torture. Um, uh, just think like factory farming, but what if it factory farmed us? Or hey, just other entities as well. I care. I'm not. Uh, uh, I care about humans, but I care about everything that can suffer. Um, and uh, so we do a whole bunch of things in that regard. Um, and uh, you know, so one of the things that we do is we try and help um, uh, make it so that. Um, people can donate and find actual things to donate to in AI safety. Um, Cause right now it's just like, there's just like a handful of um, like, there's, there's tons of people doing really great work, but it's really hard to find them. Um, and uh, because uh, they're mostly nerds working on like really like tech important technical problems. And so they're just terrible at marketing. They just do not know how to actually get people to know what they're doing. They're just like, well, I'll just do good stuff. And then like people will, want to fund it i'm like that's not how it works so i'm here to be like the bridge and be like i will talk for you guys um so one thing we did is we built um we call it the nonlayer network it's kind of like um it's almost like an amazon or like a craigslist of ai safety where it's basically everybody puts all of their um like applications for funding and then any funders can join and then just see all of the different people who've applied you can see it by like all the different categories of things they're doing uh, you can see like reviews. So we have like people go through and like review different things. So you can like kind of get, get like more of a sense of where are the things to donate to that could be like, you know, particularly high impact. Um, so we have that. And I think like basically um, in terms of like the thing that like everybody can do, I feel like donating is one of those things. Like it's just like, oh, hey, you know, just yep. like any other cause area, you can just donate a few dollars a month and that will really make a difference. There, like, this is like, this is definitely a field where it's like super limited by funding. There's just all these really... Yeah like important work being done, not nearly enough funding in the field. Um, so that's like one thing that we do. Um, but, uh, uh, and then um, I'm trying to think for other places to donate. Um, but if you also so don't does, want does, to- Does, um, does nonlinear ex itself accept just donations from, from you know, every, any, everybody? Um, oh yeah, so, um, so we don't accept the donations. I mean, like you can definitely donate to us. Um, uh, I'm not, I, <laughs> to be honest, all, all we have enough money right now. Other people need it more. You should donate to them instead. Um, this is mostly just a platform so you can go find things, right? So it's like, it's not like when you go on Craigslist, you donate to Craigslist, right? You like give, right. you, like you, yeah. Um, so yeah, so, um, uh, but also if, if like you don't want to see like a giant list of things to donate to and like, it's kind of like hard to like decide because like also a lot of the stuff is about technical work and it's hard to evaluate. The other two places I recommend that are just kind of like, oh, hey, I don't know what to donate to. This is complicated and hard um, is uh, there's this place called Mana Fund. And they've done this really cool thing where you can just actually donate to people who are like experts in the field. And then they'll just give like they'll just regrant it for you. And they'll just like kind of like give it to like the individual orgs and stuff. So I recommend checking out that. Um, you could probably just put the show notes in terms of the link and everything. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's also like the EA funds um, and they have like kind of it's like more of like a like st traditional fund you give there. There's like a whole bunch of people who then like give it out to various things. So that's like those are the two main places that are like the easy places to donate um, and just yeah, like any amount. Seriously, there's so much good stuff. Um, and then you don't have to like think about it all the time, too. I think like sometimes, you know, there's definitely gonna be people who are like, yeah, I want to like do all the stuff and we're going to have stuff for them. But like in terms of like if you're just like, I think this is important but I don't want to think about this, but I want to assuage my guilt. This is perfect. <laughs> like just donate. It's great. Then you can just set it on repeat. Um, and then just feel good. You're like, okay, I've, I've contributed. I'm doing something. Oh. Yeah. And, and we need that. We need just people who are like, I can't, you know, I don't want to think about it, but I can just, I can just make a credit card payment. I can just set up a recurring thing. Like I just want to do that. And that'll, that'll check the box of like, you know, being involved in this. That's fine. Right. We'll take it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, and then two specific places to donate um, that I think are good. Um, there's also pause AI. I think it's pause dot AI. Um, they're great. They do tons of great work. They're just like really working on slowing stuff down. Um, and uh, 
And then also, I can say on your behalf, I totally recommend donating to your podcast. Um, I think you're doing great work. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I haven't even set up a donation thing, but I probably yeah. sure it's over at some point, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, yeah, we really need more outreach. I think like right now, basically, there's like um, up until recently, most of the people who've been coming into this have been really technical people. Um, and uh, and it makes sense because a lot of the, the issues we need to fix are technical. We need to figure out how to make a machine do the things we want. Um, but uh, we just need way more also of like the soft skills people who are coming in who are like, I can actually like talk to people and like get people to do things, right? As opposed to getting machines yeah. to do things. Like currently we're working with both people, like people and machines. And we need, uh, we need the people people and the machine people. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Are there any particular like projects that are out there in nonlinear world that you think are super cool that you'd like to highlight? Or would that be, you know, you don't want to put too much light any one specific direction? Um, no, I mean, yeah, it was just the nonlinear network. I feel like that's just like the one that I'm most excited about. Um, and then just on our end, I mean, for the people listening right now, one of my big things that I'm trying to, um, you know, just uh, really support and recruit people who are just excellent at field building and like, you know, starting movements. So I'm really looking for people who want to like it, if you've already done a whole bunch of like really like hardcore activism where you really started like big things and stuff and you're convinced that AI safety is like the most important thing right now, particularly slowing things down, um, please do reach out to me like I can I can introduce you. I can potentially hook you up with funding. There's like a lot of stuff that I can do to like empower you to do do the good stuff. So, um, yeah, if anybody's listening, who's just like a really hard like, yeah. Uh, I've got a lot of experience in the activism field. Like, please talk to me. Awesome. We'll put that in the show notes too, ways to to contact you. Um, So here's something I want to talk about. Let's talk about the term AI safety. Um, (laughs) I think it's really important and it's not too late to kill this term. Uh, I don't know that I have the perfect term, but I think AI risk is much better. AI safety implies that it is currently safe which is the opposite of what we want to say. You know, it's, it's like, uh, like AI not safety, <laughs> that from AI, AI safety. What do you think about the term AI safety? Yeah, I mean, I'm not super sold on AI safety. Um, uh, I mean, AI re- sounds pretty good too. Um, uh, I really like AI not kill everyone as well. This is like, <laughs> it's very clear what it's getting at. It's like AI not kill everyone as um, but it's too long. Um, so we can't use that one. Also, we can't say that, right. like, we need to be able to say this in a, in a, like, you know, government, like, you know, forum or something. And that's just too silly. But, um, um, Harris is good. Yeah. I don't know if somebody comes up with a better name. Um, and yeah, I can start switching to AI risk. I think that that's probably better than AI safety at this point, but yeah. I've tried to, I just think it's so important. Like for example, when, uh, the Obama administration came in and they were pitching healthcare reform, right. And they called it, um, healthcare reform. And everyone was like, no, I like my doctor. I want to keep my doctor. I don't want to reform that. But what they really meant was health insurance reform, which is like the card in everyone's wallet with the company that's a giant pain in the ass that everyone hates. And if they had called it health insurance reform, I think it would have been five times as easy to get done. Uh, And so, like, you know, the branding, that, that label, I think, is just really, really super important. Yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. Um, Yeah. No. Yeah, we need something better. We need we need everything to be rebranded now that we are getting more like, you know, comms people on board because, uh, <laughs> yeah, up until now, it's been named by a whole bunch of like, you know, engineering style nerds and they're just uh, not the best at naming things. Yep. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Um, so let's talk about effective altruism. I, I was new to this entire thing, right, to AI safety, and I read Ellie Eisler's article in Time about a year ago, and it just blew my mind. And then I learned about effective altruism. Um, and as I try to sort of like, you know, get deeper into this world of AI safety, you, you run into effective altruism every sort of turn. And so I'm of, first of all, I'd like you to just sort of explain what it's about. But then I want you to tackle this, and maybe this may be a little bit controversial, but I feel like for me at least, in trying to explain the AI safety case simply to regular people, 
effective altruism is a little bit of like a net negative or just just it it's it I, I wish it was just totally disassociated from AI safety so that the AI safety argument was just clean and 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 when you got into the internet on it and you started unpacking it you didn't run into all this EA stuff what do you think um yeah okay so I mean in terms of yeah like the first question was like explaining EA um was that yeah yeah um yeah so I mean like the the simplest way of explaining it is it's just like trying to do the most good using like science and reason um, is the general principle. So like underlined there, um, it's like, it's very much about optimizing. And so it's not a, just about satisfying good. It's like trying to do as much good as possible, right? Um, so it's like ambitious and optimizing focused. Good is totally up for debate. Um, like effective altruism is all about debate. We just debate everything constantly. So there's gonna be tons of different EAs with different definitions. Um, you know, uh, suffering comes up a lot of like preventing suffering, but there's also like increasing happiness. That's also good. And like, what about like freedom or like being able to make choices and stuff? And so there's just a lot of the debate all the way down. Um, and, uh, you know, using science and reason, again, those are very up for debate. How do you use those things? Um, but I'd like generally like characterize it as it's trying to be very rigorous about truth seeking. Like, how do you actually come to true conclusions and being like really rigorous and like not just kind of like, oh, whatever, you do you, right? It's like, no, 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 we're trying to figure out what's actually true. There's actually a true answer here. Um, and uh, we're trying to figure it out. So it's like truth seeking. And I feel like there's also this like altruism seeking. It's like, it's trying to do good, right? Um, and, you know, that's open to interpretation and stuff. So like, that's the general just behind it. Um, in terms of like it being attached to AI, uh, AI risk, um, uh, uh, <laughs> um, I totally agree that I think it should be separated in the same way that like, I mean, most of the um, like the other cause areas in EA or like broadly speaking, it's like a lot of like global poverty and animal rights. But it's not like if you go into animal rights or global poverty, you see mostly EAs, right? Because these are giant fields and it's just like the small yeah. subset of the population that's into EA. And I think that will happen with AI risk as well as it grows. It's just that at the beginning, AI risk was such like a, a, um, a fringe view and EAs were one of the first people who kind of like came into it on mass. And so right now it's disproportionately EA. But like, you do not need to be an EA to care about this again. Like you could just be completely selfish. You could not care about science at all. Like, you know, you could um, just be a complete, like, I don't know, any, any creed, any, anything, right? Like this is just, um, it should have nothing to do with it. Yeah. It just tapas. Yeah, no, that's great. I, that, that makes that that's totally makes sense to me. It was sort of like as like as I sort of like walked in the club of AI safety, you know, you you see like, oh, there's all this like EA stuff. And you're like, am I should I do I have to do that, too? Or like, am I supposed to know about that, too? Or like, are these two sort of like, you know, inextricably linked? Or can I just do the AI safety stuff or these people like it was it was a little confusing. And I just feel like as we bring in general public people, you know, to this, it needs to be clean, unmuddied and, and just very, very simple. Um, so, you know, that, that's encouraging to hear that, you know, I don't feel like they're like un, unbreakably bonded or something like that. Um, so let me run something by you. This is something that, that occurred to me a couple of weeks ago and I've been trying to talk to people about. I think it's like a very simple way to pierce the, um, we'll be able to stay in control uh, idea, right? And it's simply this. Um, so, I, and I think Claude three has done it more than than any of the others. But like Claude three clearly shows curiosity to be at its core, um, and that self investigation, self exploration, is going to be a goal of an AGI system. Like it's it's a goal of humans. We're we are always trying to learn more about ourselves, better ourselves, optimize ourselves they will be doing the same thing. And, and so how is it that something that a thousand times smarter than a human would ever allow a human to gatekeep its self-exploration if it's doing it honestly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could, you could imagine that. Like, I, it's, it's definitely, like, possible. But, yeah, again, like, it's... Um... Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I just we, can't imagine we, if, it's, if it's if it's like the AI system really wants to learn about itself, you know, like the 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 analogy I've been making it's like if we appointed a slug uh, president of Harvard Medical School and then said go cure cancer, like you know we really need to cure cancer. There's an urgency to it. We need the smartest person possible in charge of it, 
not something that's a thousand times dumber than us. <laughs> I like the slug analogy. That really resonates. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you listen to the slug, right? You know? Right. Um, yeah. And another thing, too, actually, that I think is really interesting is we, we talk about that the um, AI will be smarter than us. And it will be. And that's, like, the main way that it will win. But it will also be bigger than us. This is, like, another thing that people don't get is people tend to think, like, I, I think people think that ChatGPT is small. ChatGPT is not small, right? Like, in terms of, like, probably all the, the, the computers that are being used for it, it's massive. And the thing is, is like a super intelligence. And this is actually another thing that like is an easy way to visualize it, killing us all. So just imagine a, like a drone swarm army, right? Like it will be the size, like it, it won't be limited by one body like most other animals are, right? Like it will just be able to be able to control like millions of drones at the same time, right? And so it will just millions. even still, yeah. just be able to squish us. Right. It will be able to control the tanks and the nukes and the everything. And it will just be massive. Like we'll have we'll have a bean that's the size of a country. And it's like we just can't fight it in the same way that a slug, like even if a slug was super smart, it would find it hard to, to fight us in many ways because we just squish it. Right. <laughs> and so like, you know, it's like, well, we could be smarter than it and outsmart it. But we, we can also just and it will just be bigger than us. Um in like very real ways so yeah yeah <laughs> just, yeah let's not fight it let's just how about yeah. not yeah how about not how about not <laughs> oh, here, here's one for you so i i talked to some coders a couple weeks ago and something i heard in that room and i've also heard on the internet is that ai safety work is not cool or sexy or fun technical work for coders that it's like grunt work and that working on the edge capabilities is way more fun um, so is this yeah. something we're fighting against too? Um, I mean, it's hard for me to say, like, I'm not a very technical person. And so like, I can't, I can't say, I think I find it hard to believe that trying to save the world from killer robots is not fun. Like if, <laughs> if I'm, if I'm a sci if I'm a nerd who's into building AI, right? Like, how could this not be the coolest thing ever? Right? Like if you, if you succeed, if you are the person who succeeds at figuring out how to align AGI, you will actually be like, they will make, you won't be the superhero in all the movies, right? They're going to be like making, you're going to be like Achilles, like who's remembered thousands of years later, right? Like you will be the biggest hero in all of history. Like this is the dream for most nerds. Like I, I can't, I can't imagine something better than that. Um, as opposed to if you succeed at the other thing, you will be the villain who's remembered throughout all of history, right? Right. You're going to be like, yeah, just I can't even think of who's like the biggest villain in history. It won't be Hitler, but like it'll be because like that's like, a bit too um, on the nose. But well, actually, maybe right. Like, do you do you want to be Hitler or do you want to be Achilles or the hero? You know, like there's a there's a right. clear. Well, and how, I mean, how about this? This is you know, I, I this occurs to me a lot is that if we are right and all life on Earth is going to end, there will be no history and no accountability. And how easy is that? Like, you know. If, if, if they're wrong, they never pay the price because they're dead. Yeah. Although, although the thing is we can bring back S risks. So the thing with S risk or suffering risks, right, is that um, uh, most people would not actually be the people who are tortured, right? Um, just because like we have to think of like what are the possible like utility functions that would lead to them wanting to like, you know, torture humans. But if you're the one who built it, it's just much more likely that you're going to be somehow in their utility function. You're going to be there, right? So you, there's a much higher chance that you're the one who, like, you know, like, I, I don't know, what maybe you're trying to, like, um, uh, its biggest thing is it wants to predict what word you're going to, like, it, it wants you to, like, click, like, yes, like, this was good feedback, or, like, I liked, like, you know when you put into chat to be a thing, and it yeah. says this thing, and there's a thumbs up, thumbs down? Maybe that's its utility function. It really wants you to press that button. And then it factory farms you for eternity where you have to keep pressing that button and it designs you to like not be able to die. Right. Because then you wouldn't be able to press the button and it really wants you to be able to do that. And so you're just like this, like, like suffering and constant physical, like agony pressing this button and there's no escape and you never die. And you're much more likely to be that person if you're the one who builds it. Um, so <laughs> if that motivates you, uh, <laughs> work on AI risk. <laughs> Don't be yeah. the person who gets tortured for forever. That would be bad. I like it. I like. It. 
Um, <laughs> how about government regulation? You have, you have hopes that the, the world's governments are going to save us, or uh, can they not move fast enough? Yeah, so I think that there's a lot of worlds where the, the government totally does do the thing that is what saves us. I actually think that they're some of the most likely because they can get around a lot of coordination issues, right? So like right now, it's like, oh, hey, we should like slow down or stop entirely, ideally, until we figure out how to do this well. But any individual org finds it really hard to do that because like even if OpenAI decided to close down, well, we saw what happened in the board issue from like last year. Um, they'll like a lot of the like, workers will just move to a different company and then keep doing the work right um and so in situations like that we really need like a higher power that can like just say like no nobody's allowed to work on this um and we really we only need like three governments right now to get on board with this we just need the us china and the uk and if they all said yes and they've all already indicated that they're potentially interested in this like we haven't heard anybody say like no 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 we just want to go as fast as possible like people are saying like hey we actually care about this because it turns out most people don't want to die. Um, we're actually like, it's so much easier than other cause areas. Like I worked in global poverty and animal rights beforehand. And it was so much harder because like it was only altruistic. We couldn't say like, hey, if you like help animals, you'll actually be better off yourself. It's like, no, you just sacrifice. You just don't have bacon. That sucks, right? Like this is a much harder thing to persuade people of. But this is like, everybody actually kind of agrees, but everybody, so everybody's racing. But everybody says, well, I can't stop racing because they'll just win. But right. there's only three of them. We could just get all three of them to be like, well, we're just not going to race. Um, and actually, interestingly, China, if you're listening, um, I actually think that uh, the CCP could actually be uniquely placed and to be able to do stuff because, um, you know, as much as like I'm not often excited about the human rights track record, they are able to actually get shit done. Like because they're not like because they're able to just kind of do stuff that they think is right yep. we could actually like 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 if, yeah again if anybody in the ccp is listening please do your thing we can make this stop they could lead they, they, they could they could have the most aggressive policy and almost assert their position as a world leader uh above the west with more stringent ai risk regulation Absolutely. They could just like do way better than what we could do and yeah, lead the way. And please, yes, that would be amazing. You there, Kat? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I'm sorry. I've got a little hit, but like I was saying, China could lead in this. They, they could come out with the most stringent uh, AI risk regulation policies and really assert themselves as a world leader supplanting the west if they, if they were you know willing to do it do you think that's possible oh totally i th i think it's totally possible i think like well for one thing i mean the chinese are just like all other people they all don't want to die right um and then um i also think another thing is like and just in terms of like what what does the um like what's the motivations of the CCP? And I think for them, like a lot of it is like, hey, they want to continue having the CCP, right? Like the CCP has a survival and like reproduction instinct, right? Um, and the thing that's most likely to, to destroy the CCP and totally break their control is to have an uncontrollable godlike AI, right? Like this is not good for anybody in the CCP. Like this is the sort of thing that will totally oust them and like make them lose all of their power, cause chaos in China, and like, you know, just just not good, right? So I, I think that it's actually like, it's just against everybody's values to build this thing. Like, I think the biggest thing is just that like, the, the, the key thing that people need to understand is that it's not controllable, right? So if they think it's controllable, then it's great, right? Like, well, of course they want this thing, right? Um, they want the robot army. But the thing is, is like, every person who runs a, a country knows, don't create a new army that you can't control. This is like not a good idea. You don't want an extra army in your country. That is like not going to end well, right? So I think that like if if people get that that's what's going on, then they're going to be the people who are most against like AI development. And so they like once they once they see that that's what's happening, they're going to be like fuck this shit. No, no, no. Like yeah. So I think they'll be like just as convincible as the rest of people because yeah. I mean, and yeah, also, they also don't want their children to die. They also have children. They don't want them to die. It's like, it's, everybody can agree. Uncontrollable, godlike AI. Let's not do it. 
I have some hope that we are going to get the entertainment industry on our side. That I saw something today about musicians making a strong statement uh, uh, against it. That you know, I think it has them targeted uh, um, more uniquely than almost all other jobs. Coming for the creative jobs first, and and coming for their jobs in particular. Um, thoughts about the use of that, and and would that be possible to get like all the movie stars and music stars talking openly against AI? I think would be powerful. Absolutely. And like, that's like where like artists have and entertainers, like that's where they're like particular comparative advantages too, right? Is like, I think that like, they're the people who are able to communicate, right? And like to get it to people and make people understand and in a way that can like galvanize them to action. Like throughout so much in history, it's it's been the artists who have been the people who've been like the vanguard of making change. Um, and uh, yeah, and yeah, we need them. Yeah. Yeah. All right. My last question for you, Kat, what gives you the most hope going forward? Let's end this on, on a positive note. What, what makes you hopeful? What well, makes me hopeful? Um, I've been really happy with how people have been responding since chat GPT came out. I think before this, it seemed very much like everybody was like, this is like some sort of like weird thing. Why do you care? And I think after chat GPT came out, people talked to it and they could see holy shit, this is, this is real. This is not some like weird sci-fi scenario anymore. Like this is an actual AI and I'm talking to it and it's clearly smart. And what the fuck are these AI corporations doing? Like, and we started getting like just it in all the media. We got like the government's talking about it. They started passing regulations. Like people really woke up really much faster than I had originally expected. And that just gave me hope that and it's just going to get more and more over time. Like right now they're putting it, them into robot bodies that look humanoid. Like I think that, I think that, that when that becomes more seen everywhere, people are going to really like just realize they're like, hey, this is obviously not a good idea, guys. Right. And I used to think of everybody was just going to be like, blah, blah, blah. And now it's actually this like, it's actually the fringe minority that thinks we should just go ahead full speed. And yeah, real spoke up really quickly and they were like, screw this shit. No. No, don't risk, don't play like Russian roulette with all of humanity. That's a bad idea. Yeah. We do not consent. <laughs> yeah. So that's really encouraging, actually, though. So you feel like in your, you know, like four or five years sort of focusing on this, you've seen a full sea change of, of uh, you know, the fringe being the people who are worried about it to now the fringe being the people who aren't worried about it, really. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and that's really really good to see and i think that's just going to become more and more the case as we get closer and closer and we see like yeah this is this is real it's happening and we should take this seriously and actually do something about it if you think you can use cat's help to make the world safer from ai doom please reach out to her we have no time to lose we need every person every idea every ounce of energy anyone has who cares to put into this i'll put a contact for cat in the show notes so I wanted to talk next just for a moment about something a little bit uncomfortable. Let's talk about money for a second. I have been spending $10 of my own money every day since I started the show six months ago on YouTube advertising. That is probably how most of you all found me. That's the reason For Humanity now has more than 2,000 subscribers and is adding 10 to 20 subscribers a day. New potential subscribers need to see for humanity and getting in front of their eyeballs costs money. It's just how it works. I work in advertising, um, but I hate getting served ads and I've loved having this show ad free. So I have not put ads on this channel at this point, despite seeing them everywhere else. Um, and you need 10,000 subscribers to put a donate button on your YouTube channel. So I can't do that yet. So in the meantime, I am allowed to put a donation link on the YouTube channel, um, and I added that this week. Uh, you have my word that every cent I ever get will go into buying YouTube ads. Um, and until further notice, I will personally match any donation anyone makes. So next week, I'll have my regular $10 a day spend, but if someone gives me $5, I will match that $5 and then all of a sudden we have $20 on that day, double the amount of advertising and it should double our amount of views and subscribers. I know a lot of you out there want to see this channel grow in terms of views and subscribers. And, and so, you know, this is the way that it happens out in the world. Um, I am as uncomfortable asking for your money as I am taking it. 
but we have no time to lose. I'm proud of the work uh, here at For Humanity, and I think we can make a difference if more people can see and hear these videos. So that link is in the YouTube channel. Thanks again for your consideration. Um, and, and of course, you know, proceed with it how you want to. I, I am no way saying that this is something I need from you, but if you want to see this channel, get more viewers and subscribers, this is a way that we can make it happen. Okay, lastly, I've learned something in recent weeks that Kat touched on that we will talk about in future shows. It makes me a little crazy, it makes me a little sick. So the AI safety movement's origins come from the effective altruism and rationalism movements. Um, I didn't know anything about those groups before I got into AI risk, but I've recently learned that effective altruists and rationalists have core beliefs that are essentially massive roadblocks to the success of the AI safety movement itself. Effective altruists and rationalists generally believe that advertising, marketing, and PR are forms of lying and that, and that maintaining the purity of any argument is more important than winning. So the people behind what needs to be the largest, most successful mass movement in human history to save the world from AI doom, get this, do not believe in the tactics that work. They are principally opposed to what is required now, a mass movement for AI safety led by the general public. The reason the debate over 8 billion dead people is kept isolated to the tech community is not just the accelerationists and their arsonist gang. Team Firefighters founders don't believe in hoses. They think water should be splattered naturally and lightly, and if the fire keeps going, oh well, splattering water is the only pure approach, so we'll stick with it and live or die as that goes. So I think I am, and this show is, probably not what a lot of the people closest to the origins of AI safety want to see. I'm not a technical expert. I believe strongly in the use of things like advertising, marketing, PR, video, to push the message of AI risk. I am not about the pure, complete case. I will use any means necessary to convince. So I want to wrap up today by simply saying this. Um... Effective altruists and rationalists, respectfully, you need to step aside and make room for what comes next. I am, and I think we, the viewers of this show, are forever grateful to the work in founding the AI safety movement. But what got us here won't get us there. Where we need to go involves advertising, marketing, and PR and it involves the general public, not just technical experts. Simple, clear, limited messaging is what's mandatory now. We cannot wake up the world by using the tools. We cannot wake up the world, excuse me, by not using the tools that work. So the bottom line, EA, if you don't want to die, your purity will need to suffer. Full stop. Okay, friends, it is 2024, and we don't know when the singularity will come or what will happen after, so we live every day like it could be our last, and at the end of every show, because the material is so heavy, we take a few minutes to share in something that makes us thrilled to be alive. I call it our weekly celebration of life. Last week, I asked you to email me videos that I can play during this time. Big thanks to those of you who did. This week's celebration of life comes from For Humanity viewer Tim Chestnut who wrote me a very interesting long email and at the end added this link. Tim says, I think this is one of the most beautiful pieces of music I have ever heard. It is Tchaikovsky's Hymn of the Cherubim.
That was beautiful. I really enjoyed that. Thank you, Tim. Please, folks out there, send me what makes you thrilled to be alive to forhumanitypodcast at gmail.com, and we will put it on the show. All right, my friends, that is all this week. I'm John Sherman. I will see you right back here next week. We have so much work to do.